Uh, speaking of which, we I mean, this is almost as interesting of a topic as the Gandalf game, but we've got some auto GPT in the house. Is Silent around? Where are you at? And I'm going to find the microphone while you're, while you're coming hello, hello. back on. Hey, hey, hey. there you he is. Me? What's up, dude? I'm good. I'm good. How are you guys? I'm really good. So agents are all the rage right now. And you, sir, are doing a lot with agents. Uh, Auto GPT blew up and it is super cool to see where things are going. I am excited for your talk right now about what, uh, where the agents, where the puck's going with agents and some best practices. And I'm going to let you kick it off and I'll be back in, uh, I think it is 10 minutes that, uh, no, 30 minutes. I'll be back in 20 minutes, 25 to ask you some questions in the chat. Wonderful. Uh, you guys can see my screen? Can, yeah. Okay. Amazing. All right. Very happy to be here. Um, love the, love the energy in the ML ops community. Uh, and let's talk about agents, man. Agents are all the rage. Um, you know, I want to, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, today about what an agent actually is and how they came about, um, what led to this like recent, um, you know, this recent agent revolution, uh, why do they suck right now? Cause let's be honest, um, they're not the best at the moment. Um, and you know, how do we, how do we improve? How do we get to commercial use cases? Um, and, uh, what does the future look like? So yeah, let's start with what an agent is. Um, I think a lot of you guys have a good idea, but I'm going to, I'm going to take a bit of a technical approach here. So, um, hopefully some of you guys are familiar with DeepMind and familiar with this image here. So, uh, if you mentioned agents two years ago to anyone in the AI field, uh, they would assume you were talking about reinforcement learning. And if you ask ChatGPT what an agent is, you know, it's cut off is, is at the end of 2021. Um, it will tell you about reinforcement learning. It will not tell you about auto GPT. It won't tell you about language models. It'll say reinforcement learning agents, right? And how do reinforcement learning agents work? Uh, it's very similar to, to, to agents these days, right? You have, um, you have your environment. Uh, I have this covering my slides. There you go. Um, yeah, you have your, uh, environment. Uh, and an agent in an environment, right? And the agent performs actions in the environment uh, and then, you know, gets us the state of the environment, meaning it does something. And I was like, okay, what changed in my environment? And did it change in a way that I wanted it to change, right? And that's how you would train these models. And so, um, you know, the world state would come in, like, you know, I picked up a block, a block is now to my right. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's, these, there's this giant inscrutable matrix that no human can understand. Um, and there's some action that comes out, like grab or move to the right um, or whatever else it may be, right? But what if there could be a different processing engine, right? Uh, and I know when when ChatGPT all of uh, came out, everyone here, uh, at least me uh, speaking, I was very astonished at, at how far language models has, uh, have come. Um, and I know some people don't have an internal monologue, but for those that do, I'm sure one of your first thoughts was like, hey, isn't this just thoughts? Like how sentient is this thing? Um, and we're not going to get into philosophy here. We're not going to talk about how sentient it is, but we do know that it's good at generating uh, words and it's good at talking, right? Uh, and so, you know, GPT-4 came out uh, and this is when the real revolution took off. This is when we saw, um, you know, what's really possible. It thought at levels that we didn't think were, at least I didn't think was going to be possible for years. Uh, and it unlocked things um, that I didn't, you know, that, 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 that are extremely advanced for, for, you know, what we thought we were able to do, uh, four or five months ago. Um, and now what you were able to do is you were able to talk to this giant inscrutable matrix. Um, and you were able to have some sort of output that you could understand. It wasn't just a grab function, right? It wasn't just grab with the world state coming in. It was, you know, Hey, can you do this for me? Then it said, uh, here is why you should do this. Here's what I think, right? And this is essentially a brain. Um, you can think of it, you know, this, this, this brain is essentially doing processing. This is an internal monologue that's happening that's asking for actions in the real world and then reacting to those actions. So the same as a reinforcement learning agent, uh, but now we're using a language model for the brain instead of a, um, you know, a, a giant inscrutable matrix. Um, 
and you know we can zoom in on any of these arrows, right? This flow goes. You, you have you have an input that comes in. There's some processing that happens. Then the language model is like, all right, let's let's make an action happen. Um, and then there's some reflection on the action, and it either continues looping or it says, okay, like, would you like me to confirm this purchase? And so not only are you able to uh, have you know see see that these see see what actions are being performed and why they're being performed, you're also able to talk to this agent. Right and ask it and nudge it in different directions, and this is very valuable. Um, and this led to uh, you know a, a, a big revolution in in AI, where we now have agents where if you connect everything together, uh, you have something that, something that loops and can perform actions. So Auto GPT blew up. This was back in April. Um, there was a few different videos. There was this one where you know it could it could write its own code and then run that code. Um, and it could like retrieve and write up to date information. Like you ask it to, you know, uh, on the right here, this demo is asking it to retrieve the information um, of Auto GPT GitHub, which you know ChatGPT definitely does not have that, that information. That would require a Google search or two. And uh, one of the questions that I get quite often is, what can Auto GPT do? Uh, you know, I've seen it make a chess game that you can play in the console. Uh, you know, it's created a play plan. It's organized files for me. It's gotten the revenue of a company from last year. But the truth is, um, is that agents suck right now. Um, they're they're not that great. You know, these applications only happen once in a while and with nudging. You know, the, the nice thing is is that you can talk to it, but if you were to leave it up to its own devices, often if you if you've played with AutoGPT or another agent, you see that it falls into um, endless loops or it gets confused or doesn't actually complete the task in the way that you want it to complete, right? which is one, the beauty of being able to prompt it, but two, this reduces the commercial applications uh, outside of chat. Um, but regardless, the sparks are there. There's a reason why I blew up. We recently had 150,000 stars on GitHub. Um, you know, it's because you can see the sparks. You can see, wow, like once in a while with prompting, you can make this happen. You can really make a chess game. You can really just say, uh, please make a chess game for me and it does it for you. You can really just say, give me the revenue of this company and it does it for you, right? And that's beautiful. Like that. So many jobs are made up of, um, or so many parts of jobs are able to be augmented by this, right? Everyone in the future will be able to have a personal assistant, and we can see sparks of that. That's why everyone's so excited by this. But yeah, I mean, back to the um, back to the back to the cold hard truth is that agents aren't there right now, um, and you know, there's a few reasons for that. Um, there's two main ones I would say, and they're kind of linked, and um, you know, they, they they they're yeah, they're linked. Uh, and, and the first one is reliability. Um, you know, agents are very robust, so you have a very large amount of tasks that you can do, and a lot of different interpretations uh, with natural language, right? When you're talking in, in the language of code, for example, it's much more logical. There's a certain flow of data, um, and there's something that, you know, an if statement means an if statement. But when you're getting to, you know, for example, um, natural language, right, when you talk to someone, uh, words can mean a lot of different things. And so that makes it very hard to pin down on what the user really wants. And disambiguation is definitely going to be um, a big thing in the future. Another thing is the non-determinism. Um, these big matrices, they're probabilistic, right? Even though you're talking to it through natural language, the stuff that's happening in between before there's an output, it's probabilistic. Meaning there is some differences, even if, um, you know, if you've played with OpenAI before, there's a temperature setting. If you set the temperature to zero, in theory, all of the outputs should be the same given the inputs. But uh, oftentimes, a single word is changed. And if a single word is changed, you can imagine the downstream effects, right? If a single word is changed in this first prompt, in, in the response to the first prompt, then this prompt is going to be different. Um, and and as you go further and further along, the the downstream effects of having a single word in one prompt earlier on uh, is going to be large, massive. Um, and uh, the other thing is that obviously you get reactions or responses or changes from the real world, and the real world is not deterministic. We know that. There's random bugs that come up. Sometimes the internet doesn't work. You know, humans do a lot of debugging day to day. Um, and then, and then the other problem is alignment. I mean, this is kind of falls into reliability, but um, this is also why reliability is so important. Um, you know, you have the potential for irreversible actions, and, and I'll get into that a little bit later. 
um, in, in a couple of slides. So the benchmark for reliability is the robotic process automation industry. While agents are sexy, you know, and you use language models and you can talk to it, the benchmark for reliability is, you know, companies like Zapier, which you can, uh, you can put together a deterministic flow and it'll work 100% of the time. It's connected through APIs, you know, quote unquote, mimics human actions. Um, it's a sequence of steps. It happens without human intervention, so you can't talk to it, but it works 100% of the time. Um, and uh, it's deterministic, right? Uh, and, you know, this is, a big re this is a big problem for agents is you can't have a deterministic flow that you set up because every single time your actions are different. Every single time you can interpret the words, the task that, 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 uh, that a user asks you differently. Um, and uh, again, the other problem is alignment. Um, there's very little margin for error when you have things, actions that are irreversible. For example, you don't want to send an email that isn't, that you can't, you can't take back emails, right? So your error rate has to be 0%. You can't send 100 emails and one of them are just plain wrong. That could have huge effects. You have to have very, very high reliability for sending emails for working with the file system. For example, here, you know, that I, I thought this tweet was pretty funny. Um, there was an open source um, version of uh, ChatGPT's, uh, you know, code interpreter, and someone asked it to ask uh, j uh, delete the JSON files in a specific folder, and it ended up deleting all the JSON files from the laptop. Um, you know, which is funny, but at the same time, you can imagine, like, you don't want this happening. If you, if you have a commercial application, you can't have... Uh, uh, you have to have a, a perfect reliability rate. You can't have stuff like this happen. And you know, this isn't malicious, right? This is, this is innocent. This is innocently malicious, I guess you can say, where it didn't mean to um, you know, harm the user in any way, but the truth is, is that all the JSON files are deleted. And um, there's a lot of things that need to be improved, as I've been mentioning. There's, you know, prompt engineering needs to be improved. Um, I guess this is, this is more of a, uh, a point I'll get into a little bit later, uh, but everything that 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 constitutes an agent needs to be improved. It's more in the field of research and development than it is in commercial application. We haven't figured out the best summarization techniques. For example, there are context windows. Um, you know, uh, OpenAI has a certain context window of you know 16K with its 3.5 GPT 3.5 model, and you want to be able to fit everything within this context, right? But when you have a history of 10 actions, right, you can't fit the actions without decompressing them, right? And it's not useful to, because you want to only get the right act actions. Um, and so that's where memory comes in as well. There's been a lot of talk recently, and I know there's been a couple of talks here uh, at the conference about uh, retrieval augmented generation, um, you know, using memory or using, um, you know, stored information to retrieve, uh, to reduce hallucinations and retrieve uh, information about the world. Um, there's other issues as well, right, with, with the complexity of understanding. Like sometimes, um, you know, one of the big problems is that GPT doesn't know its own limits. You have to prompt it in a very specific way to say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, and ask the user for advice or uh, to disambiguate. Um, and also the tokens per second is quite low. Um, I know there's been some talk about tokens per second, um, but this is, this is a big deal. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there was a, a talk by Martin I saw uh, a few weeks back uh, Martin Shrekley, where he talked about, you know, the analog of tokens per second to uh, hertz per second, and how right now we don't have enough hertz in order to have, um, you know, complex processing at the order of the brain, what the brain is able to do. Um, but in the future, when you have more tokens per second, and when you have uh, more complicated processing within those tokens, we're able to do more. Um, so there's a lot of work here to be done. AutoGPT is also working on a paper around like misalignment and security and safety monitoring. Um, the, that's actually due today. We're submitting to NeurIPS, um, you know, around essentially trying to find, uh, creating a monitor to, um, you know, make sure uh, no response, no external action is misaligned and trying to predict if the world state is going to be unsafe afterwards, um, whether it's through malicious misalignment or innocent misalignment like, like here. Um, and um, when we talk about improving agents, it's also like important. That this is at a high level, right? How do you actually improve the agents? How can you actually make these changes and see things improving? 
some of these things are obvious, right? Like GPT-5. But when it gets to prompt engineering, uh, it's hard to know that when you update a prompt, it improves your entire model. And so when we look at how going back to reinforcement learning agents work, is you have some sort of action in the environment, you get some sort of observations, uh, and you get a reward, right? And you want to perform actions that maximize your reward. If you, and you select for agents that maximize rewards. You have iterations of agents that are better at maximizing reward, right? And it's the same thing for agents, uh, language model agents, right? But instead of a, a giant matrix, that giant matrix is, is, is abstracted away, abstracted away with this um, architecture of the agent. You have a collection of prompts, um, and then with every iteration, you improve the agent to maximize the reward or how good it is. And what does it mean to improve an agent? You iterate on one of these things. But typically, um, today, a lot of iteration happens mainly in the prompt engineering aspect. Because prompt engineering, what it really does is, and without having to modify the parameters of the network, you can change how the activations flow and what kind of response you have from the network. Um, I, won't, I won't dive too deeply into that. How does a prompt engineering workflow work? Right? If we go back to this graph from before, you have an input prompt. This input prompt is a summary of the Roman Republic in a TXT file, please. Uh, and then it hits this brain, right, which is a language model. And you have some sort of prompt. In this case, this prompt is reflect on the user input and create a plan. Um, then you have the response from the language model, which is one, you search the American Revolution. Two, you find the website, blah, blah, blah. And then you have, uh, based on this plan, you construct another prompt that says select an action that can be executed to advance this plan. And then you have a thought, which is execute the web search with the search query. Um, and then it executes the actual command to perform an action in the environment. In this case, searching for a website that contains this information. And this improvement happens in this prompt category. You change the prompt and you get different responses, which are better. But the issue is, is where's the reward function, right? There's no way to know when you change a prompt, or it's very hard to know that when you change a prompt or you make any of those improvements I was talking about before, that it actually improves your agent. And we were having issues that, uh, about this at AutoGPT, right? We had many thousands of pull requests, like 2,000 pull requests. Uh, and at the start of the project, it was very hard for us to be able to uh, see if someone had actually tested their pull request and had actually understood if it improves or not and how it improves or not. And we didn't have the time to be able to, to comprehensively tense, to test all these pull requests either. And so the project was pulled in all different directions, right? The way that it was done traditionally was that, you know, you have this, this input, uh, the summary of the Roman Republic in a TXT file, and then the agent would do its thing. And then you would look at it and be like, oh, it performed quicker, or oh, it was cheaper. Oh, it looks better, right? But it would be a very qualitative assessment. Um, and based on this qualitative assessment, you would then update it. And as I mentioned, this took the project in many different directions and led to some stagnation for a couple months. Um, you know, I like this, I like this, uh, without, I like to say this without a compass, you don't know where you're going, right? And so we created a compass. We built an objective benchmark. Um, you know, there, we just have, we have a, a skill tree with uh, challenges that get harder. And, you know, the simplest challenge is write the word Washington to a TXT file. If you can't solve this one, you don't go to harder challenges. You can imagine that every time you update something, you check. Um, and we would run this in our CI. You know, we, we, we tested a whole bunch of agents, but we would run this for AutoGPT, and we would check, when you make improvements, does it actually improve AutoGPT when you make improvements to the code? Uh, and now you can quantify it. Now you can objectively get you know, the cost. You can get the time it took to run. And you can get some sort of score, basically a reward function, to see if it's improving in a positive or a negative direction, essentially. Um, and you know, we we this is um, twenty five thousand logs worth of data, logs meaning responses from a language model uh, over the month of August, and you can see that a few of these agents are using the benchmark, and there has been steady improvements in the field. So the future is looking bright, um, and uh, we we at AutoGPT we truly believe this that right now, you know, there was this hype in in, in uh, you know agents, but now it's time to build some real stuff, right? And so we have a hackathon going on at the moment, and we're kind of piloting some of the things we've built recently uh, around, um, you know, having some sort of stem cell agent, uh, which uh, implements an agent protocol, which allows for standardization and gives you a way to kick off building your agent. 
testing. We also have this testing suite that we then converted into, um, you know, being able to comply with uh, this template. Uh, and you have a front end now, so you can view your agent working, and you can run this benchmark from your front end. Um, so if you're interested, you know, join the Discord, send us a message. Uh, feel free to message me as well, um, and join the hackathon if if that's something you're inclined to do. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to wrap up by saying, you know, the future is bright. Um, I, I I don't think I need to explain why. We all see the sparks. There's a reason why everyone's excited about agents, um, and uh, you know, I think within the next two, three years, we're all going to have our own personal assistant. This is this is going to be the future. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for listening. I um, hope you learned a thing or two. Dude, awesome stuff. I knew it was going to be good, but I didn't realize it was going to be that good. I really like this idea of the stem cell agent that you were talking about right there. And so I encourage anyone who is doing anything in this field to check out the hackathon because I know you all are... Um, putting out some incredible content. We have a question for you, though. We have a few questions that have come through if you're willing to answer them. I don't know if you are, if you are that daring, but... Yes, let's do it. Let's do it, man. Here we go. So has any model shown better results than GPT-4 at agent tasks if fine-tuned for that specific task? We haven't experimented too much with fine-tuning. Um... Honestly, prompt uh, prompt tuning is or prompt engineering has been effective enough to where we haven't needed to dive into prompt tuning yet. Um, there is some interesting results from the benchmark, and some of the things that we saw was that GPT 3.5 is actually better at following instructions, surprisingly. So a lot of the times, if we wanted a specific like JSON output, we would use 3.5 over 4. So 4 would be useful for like complex processing and reflecting. Um, but then, you know, 3.5 would be like, it's much quicker, but also it's just better at following instructions. So if you want like a JSON format, you would ask, like, it's easier to ask 3.5 than 4. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Any other little tidbits about like that, uh, that you can share that you found? Um, GPT-4 has probably gotten worse as Ooh. well. That's the consensus. The you're the, yeah, you're the second, third person to say that this conference today. Right? <laughs> wow. so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, Matt Tay and the incredible group that he has at Stanford has put out a paper on this. So it's not like a super hot take, but it's interesting to say that you, you've you seen it, like you felt it. Yeah, yeah. And and when you when you use the March model versus the uh, like the un, 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 unpinned model, you can see there there's a difference on the benchmark. Wow. Okay. All right. So that that's that's awesome to hear. I mean, this is uh there is something that Nicholas threw in the chat that I want to mention too before I before I go to the next question, which is the reward function or closing the loop is the key part to systematically improve AI systems, and it's incredibly hard in practice. Yep that I think it just echoes what you were talking about in your com in your talk. So the next uh, question we've got for you is how do we make sure that every time we update something to improve one thing, there's no degradation in other skills? That's a, that's a great question. And I, I love, I love the way whoever asked that question is thinking. Um, and it's, it's very valid and it's something that we have thought about. So for the benchmark, the UI currently doesn't have this functionality. Um, but in our command interface, we've added functionality for like a dash dash improve um, and a dash dash maintain flag. So if your um, you know your your if a challenge is passed three times in a row, then we assume we add it to the regression tests category, and we assume that your agent can beat it. Um, and then you can do a regression test, which is dash dash maintain. So it just runs the tests that you already. Um, you know that you beat, so like maintenance. Mm. And typically we would run, you know, maintenance tests when we're approving a pull request. Um, but then you would run like a full run, you would run dash dash improve once a day to check, you know, on these more complicated challenges, did it, um, did it actually like improve today? Um, so yeah, good question. Excellent. The next question is kind of, uh, pinning on the question before this, or not necessarily a question, but the statement before this re around the reward functions. Can you talk a bit more about the reward function and how you measure it? Have you revised this over time? 
Yeah, and we still are working on it. Like this is this is all a work in progress. We haven't figured out the, the best way to do this. Um, but you essentially have a collection of variables, right? There's it's not it's not as objective as with reinforcement learning, right? With re reinforcement learning, you can get a number that shows your reward, and you can use that number to adjust. Um, here, it's a little bit more soft because you're trying to map out this uh, this space using uh, challenges or tasks that you ask and then evaluate. Um, and so, you know, uh, in terms of in terms of the, the benchmark itself, what we realized is that you need to be specific about what what kind of challenges you create. Before we were thinking we wanted to make the challenges incremental, and so you can have some sort of uh, some clear distinction of like this is where I, this is where um, my agent doesn't work anymore, uh, and where I can improve it. But um, Challenges are expensive to run, right? It's like it's asking an agent to perform a task, um, and so it's better to have challenges that are more sparse but measure more and are more based around actual use cases, um, such as you know, like adding information to a CSV file or getting links from from people, rather than having proxy tests. Like we had memory tests before that would just directly measure the memory of an agent, um, but those were expensive. Uh, and those can also be measured through actual use cases. Um, so that's, you know, that's kind of skirting around the point, but that's some of the learning we've had. Well, speaking of money and things being expensive, we do have a question around that. How do you deal with high costs associated when using agents? Yeah, uh, I mean, get VC funding. That's the question, man. <laughs> that's the question. Um, that's you ask OpenAI for credits. Uh, you, <laughs> you do your best to cache responses. Um, you know, we've, we've experimented with response caching, uh, in terms of like, you know, if you have a similar flow, you just use a cached response. But the issue with response caching is that you just, it, it's very hard to make anything in the system deterministic because anything that you make deterministic will have downstream effects. And it's not actually, uh, true to what the prompt response would have been, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a better response than that. Yeah, yeah, it's It's so fluid, right? And each time you ask it, it's like caching just puts too hard of requirements on it that it feels like it can't, it doesn't have that wiggle room that you're looking for when you really need it exactly. to execute things. So yeah. last one for you, and then we're going to jump. What makes you feel that GPT-4 is worse It is, well, first of all, it's not as good at instruction following, uh, as I was mentioning. Um, second, it gets confused more easily. Um, it it seems to make more assumptions um, rather than just listening to what you're saying. Uh, and I know that there was a paper about this as well, which with actual hard evidence that that would probably be worth more worth reading than what I'm saying right now. Um, but yeah, I would say I would say those two things, assumptions and instruction following. Okay, I lied. I just saw there's a whole plethora of questions in the chat right now. So we have another minute. I'm going to ask them, try and do rapid fire. How did you set these okay. benchmark tests? How do you evaluate how hard the task is objectively? That's another great question. Um, so rapid fire, we did it with human evaluation. I just looked at it. I was like, yo, is this harder or easier? And then I set a response for it. And you know, the data shows that agents are worse at beating the challenges that were more advanced, but the um, that that I said or that we we object or we uh, subjectively said are more advanced. But you can also do like a, a, a Bayesian, like um, a, 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 you can you can run some some math to figure out what is actually harder versus assigning uh, actual difficulties to them. We just haven't done it yet. All right. Is there any common protocol or understanding way of defining various interactions among agents? Because having many agents and then having many ways of interaction interacting is a bit too much or no? Yeah, there, there was a few papers around this, around um, multi-agent models. I, I recommend you check out MetaGPT. Mm. Um, there was also a paper, an agents paper that came out uh, around a framework. Regarding standardization, that's that's something that we're really focused on as well to be able to you know plug in our benchmark or UI uh, into any agent. Um, there's currently an initiative going on with with an agent protocol through the um, AI Engineer Foundation, um, which essentially just is, 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 a, is a common interface for all agents to use so that um, anyone can plug into any agent. Um, 
and you know this came from a need to yeah be able to to standardize and plug in tools into any agent um, and to call any agent in no way. Well, my man, this has been an absolute pleasure, and I'm so thankful that you came on here. You taught us a bit about agents. As you know, you're feeling it more than anybody. They're all the rage. We're all trying to figure out how we can get them to work reliably and what that entails. Also, what we can build with them. And so I love to see what you're doing. I will encourage everyone, if you are wanting to do stuff with agents, you just mentioned there is a hackathon that you're doing with uh, right now on the Lab Lab email, or uh, sorry, the URL. We'll drop that in the chat so that anybody who wants to get involved can. And silent dude, have a thanks. I guess is all I can say. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you're if you're in SF as well, DM me. There may be a couple opportunities for for people here. But uh -oh. yeah, thanks for having me. Ooh, uh oh, you guys are hiring. Uh no, we're holding uh we're holding a, a little hackathon um oh. on the seventh to eighth. So. All right. Sounds cool. More exclusive than than the than the lab lab one. Oh, you can get a special invite using the promo code MLOps Community LLMs in Production. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll set that up. Just add, just put M uh, MLOps sent me uh, when you apply. And, uh, there you go. That may be a good thing or a bad thing. You'll figure that out soon enough. <laughs> <laughs>